Are you as passionate about local governance and municipal issues as I am? Well, then the Cross Border Interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought provoking conversations focusing on municipal matters from across Canada. And now, you have the chance to be part of our incredible journey. By backing our show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us grow and bring more exciting content to your ears. Now, you might be asking yourself, what sets the cross-border interviews apart from other shows? Well, we're not your average show. We dive deep into the unique challenges, successes, and innovative solutions of municipalities from across Canada. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. By supporting our show, you become an essential part of our mission to amplify the voices of local leaders and shed light on the issues that matter most to our communities. Together, we can foster meaningful change and create stronger, more vibrant communities within our great country. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. No matter how small, your contribution makes a significant difference and allows us to continue producing great shows, like the one you're about to hear. Together, let's make municipal issues matter again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored to welcome to the show from the town of Stratford, Prince Edward Island, Mayor Steve Ogden. Steve, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Not nice bad. You. Not, not bad, sure. and I'm so happy to have you on the show. So I want to start with the big question that I ask all my guests who have ever come on this show, so you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, I guess it uh, it started, Chris, with the uh, being invited to a meeting when I first moved into this uh, area in 1984. Uh, I was uh, a neighbor came by and I got, had gotten to know him over the past few weeks and uh, he invited me to a meeting, a town meeting. He said that uh, they're going to be uh, electing uh, representatives for the area and uh, would I come and would I vote for him? And I said, certainly. So I didn't know anything about the area. I didn't know anything about the politics or anything like that. So I went to the meeting and uh, the long and the short of it is uh, uh, I got elected and he didn't. <laughs> and we we drove back together. <laughs> wait, wait a second. So you're and we're still, relatively and we're, and we're new to the community, yeah. and you get elected in the meeting that you were going to go vote for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, and I did vote for him. I did. I did vote for him. And uh, there were there was only him, and there were twenty three people at the meeting, and uh, they were electing six representatives. And uh, so I don't know what happened or how it happened. I didn't really understand it. And so I came away, and I was elected to this. Uh, the Kepik Kinlock Town Council, which uh, which I served on for for nine years, and uh, it was a uh, it was an excellent group. Uh, we got a lot done. There was a, it's a it's a really expanding area, growing area, and it's um, a lot of new families, uh, a lot of newcomers. Uh, we uh, in 1995, uh, the five uh, unincorporated commu uh, communities uh, amalgamated into one municipality called Stratford. Uh, which it has been since 1995. In 1995, we were 4,500 people, and we've now grown to uh, about 11,500. Wow. So you've almost doubled yeah. in 20 years. That's that's yeah. a significant increase. What do you attribute that to? Well, I think it's a, it's a really attractive area. It's uh, very close to Charlottetown, uh, although we're separated by a, a river, uh, you know, quite a, quite a big body of water and, uh, and a bridge. Uh, but it is an attractive area. We have water on three sides. We have beaches, and uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, a, a fairly, uh, uh, you, you know, it, it, it's a, it was a suburban community, and now we're moving into a, a full-service community where we're developing a downtown. Uh, 
a, a business group has uh, purchased uh, a lot of our uh, vacant land in the town, uh, mostly around the town center, and uh, they're developing a downtown. Uh, it's about a billion dollar project over the next uh, several years, uh, but it, uh, it's sort of like writing on a blank slate. They're, uh, they're able to develop something, and they said it doesn't happen very often, this sort of thing occurs, that they're able to uh, basically use the latest technology and uh, things like uh, moving towards uh, energy efficiency and, uh, uh, you know, best use of the land and, uh, you know, good planning principles and, and all those sorts of things. So before we talk about the town as a whole, I want to talk about who you are and get to know why you decided and why you continue to put your name forward for municipal governance, because it is, to quote a friend of the show and a friend of mine, Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, it is the government of proximity, the decisions you make, you see the actions of those decisions the day after. What keeps you involved in your local municipality and coming back for more and running for office again, because your first election, as you just said, was uh, way back in 1984. You spent four, nine years on council and you're still doing it. So what, what, what brings you continue to come back? Well, I think uh, Scott hit it right on the head. Uh, I think it is uh, getting things done. I think it's uh, it's a matter of, you know, I was, I don't call myself a politician. I call myself a representative of, of the people. And uh, I think that's an important distinction because, uh, you know, good policy uh, makes good politics. Uh, if you, uh, if you do the right uh, policy or the good policy for the right reasons and you explain it to people, you'll get reelected. Um, I've, I've always been involved in, in the community uh, since I moved here and, and it's, you know, whether it be scouts, I was a scout master, I was on the administrator, uh, a leader and uh, and then as a hockey coach i figured if i'm sure if i'm taking my boys i have three boys and if i'm taking them to the games uh, i may as well be doing something while i'm there something useful so uh, i would either take on a, a help with the coaching or help with managing or uh, or something along those lines or or just keeping score or whatever and uh, same thing with baseball a, a friend of mine asked me again in 1984 when i first came here to uh, to help him coach his, uh, his son in baseball. And uh, we didn't have kids at the time. And uh, I got involved with, uh, with him and I learned the coaching business and uh, ended up uh, coaching for quite a few years after that and going, you know, like rep, rep teams and, uh, and, and really good teams. And I always found it really rewarding, uh, both the, the relationships you make and also, um, you know, the, getting things done where you can see the results of your work at the end of the day, uh, you know, I've worked in so many jobs where um, you you do a report or you do something and it gets put on a shelf and nothing happens. But when you're actually able to have some influence over your environment and actually, uh, you know, see the results of your work uh, and, and and also to work with a good team and to get, you know, to get help people achieve their potential and uh, and get uh, get the best uh you know, get to get them to put their best foot forward and and really uh, work together to uh, you know for the good of everybody. It uh, it's really a great feeling to, uh, to to see that sort of uh, synergy in action, and so uh, so that's why I've been involved and I stay involved, and I hope to be involved for a while yet. I mean, I'm I'm getting older, but uh, I'm still enjoying it just as much, if not more, than I did because as you as you get older, you learn things too, eh? You learn sort of what uh, you know how to get things done and what works best with people, and uh, and uh, you know I've always believed in being positive and have always believed in really trying to work together that, uh, you know, look, have empathy, look at things through other people's eyes and, and try to, if they have objections to what you want to do, try to find out why they have those objections and, uh, and to work together to, uh, to address them. So, so those are the sorts of things that, you know, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still um, enjoying doing what I'm doing and uh, I hope to hope to continue for a while. I want to talk about the role as as mayor and as a council in general, because you have to represent every single person in your community, but you have to look at the bigger picture as the town and you have to sort of move the town forward, but you have to remember the issues that are facing the community today and not just look at the future. How do you balance the needs of right now compared to where you want and where the town needs to be 10 years from now? Is it challenging to sort of look at the bigger picture while not trying to forget about the people who have put you in this position, but also the people of your community? 
Well, I've I've watched a couple of uh, your interviews with other mayors, uh, Chris, and uh, I find that uh, you know the, the the big thing, the big common thread, and and everything, and it's true with me as well, is uh, is listening, is is hearing what people are saying, and and under, trying to understand why they feel the way they do, and. Uh, um, and also uh, relying, you know, like I'm not the smartest person in the world, but uh, I do know a lot of really smart people who, uh, you know, I really uh, respect their, uh, I respect everybody's opinion, and I respect everybody's point of view, and I try to understand them all. Um, and uh, I, I think that uh, if you if you do that, uh, and, and you look at, you know, where the town is heading, and, uh, and what some of the other societal uh, pressures are uh, and and opportunities are the big thing is opportunities opportunities don't come along every day and uh, you really have to be uh, positioned to uh, be able to take advantage of them to be able to take advantage of technological advances to be able to uh, look at uh, you know the direction that uh, you know governments in general are heading uh, democracies heading uh, you know like uh, there's there's a couple of views of democracy. One is that you should listen to you know do a referendum on every issue, and uh, and that presupposes the fact that everybody's well informed and that everybody has access to the same information and has done the same level of due diligence as uh, you know yourself and your council have done and the staff have done, which isn't always the case. Or there's the other view that I personally hold, and that is that I'm elected to take to make decisions uh, together with the council. Uh, that other people don't have time to um, uh, really delve into uh, the, the issues and the analysis. And and once you make those decisions, to really make sure that you do whatever you can to make other people, the, the, the voting public, understand why those decisions were reached and how it's in the best interest of the town. So, so that's a challenge, uh, especially with social media, where you get a lot of dissension and it's easy for, you know, everyone has a megaphone and uh, depending on how loud your voice is, uh, uh, you 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 always have a, a following and uh, um, but it's to it's to make sure that you stay away from the uh, personal and and stick to the uh, the facts and and everything is all for the good of the town every decision that we make is based on what's in the best interest of the town both long term and short term and uh, so that's that I know that that it is a challenge to really look at the future nobody knows what the future is going to hold uh, you know, there's uh, nobody anticipated the pandemic. Nobody anticipated uh, twenty, you know, two thousand and you know nine eleven or anything like that. Those there are things that can happen that you have no control over. That you have to be able to uh, be uh, be able to adapt to any condition and be able to uh, be nimble and uh, uh, and and be resilient. I mean, we had a hurricane here in Prince Edward Island in September, uh, September twenty fourth last year, and it turned everything upside down, like all, all the plans, everything It blew down, uh, you know, 40% of our forests. Uh, people were without electricity for almost a month in a lot of cases in our town, about three weeks. Uh, that's that's a long time. Uh, if, it, if it had been in the winter, people would have died, uh, you know, but but uh, so so we learned from that. And we're trying to be resilient. Uh, we're trying to be self-sufficient. We're trying to be, uh, you know, have local uh, local resources. Uh, that we're able to to fall back on or rely on if uh, if anything should happen. Um, anyway, I, I, I guess I, I getting away from your original question. No, but, uh, but it it brings up my next question though because you talk about it because you're presented with a but uh, a package an agenda package for each of your council meetings, and you have to be engaged, informed of everything that administration puts in that agenda package. So that way, when you have to vote on it, you're well informed on what administration wants, what your residents wants and needs are. And then at the end of the day, you have to make the final decision. And I, I recently spoke to a mayor in Southwestern Ontario. He's actually, sorry, a warden uh, from Southwestern Ontario. And he told me that at the end of the day, as long as he feels comfortable putting his head on his pillow and making the right decision that he believes is in the best interest of his community, he knows he's done a good job for you. How important is it to be informed on what the decision you're making is, but also engaging with the residents on what they want as well? Yeah, that's a very complex issue because it goes right to the core of democracy. Uh, you know, and, <laughs> and I go back to something I said earlier about uh, 
the two views of democracy that you, uh, you either reflect your constituents in every decision, constituents wishes uh, in every decision you make, or else you uh, you look at what you think in your heart and your mind is a, is the best thing for the community. And we always uh, go with the with the latter that uh, you know, uh, and I think all members of the council are doing that. Although there's a there's an awful temptation to really uh, be populist and and really try to uh, do the popular decision rather than the right decision. And uh, the challenge, as I said, is to make townspeople or the residents understand first of all the issues and 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 right, more and more people's attention span are are much uh, less than they used to be and. So you have to be able to encapsulate the, a point of view within a you know a one or two minute or thirty second soundbite or whatever, and also that they understand the repercussions of uh, of the different options that uh, you know and and then at the end of the day the reasons why you make the decision you make because I think it's a it's a given that you're going to make the right decision uh, the what you think is the right decision for the town and for the most of the townspeople. And that you're not catering to an influential group or to a, a particular special interest area or or whatever that you're doing it in the best interests of the community and and all the people in the community not just uh, just some i have been very uh passionate about the apathy that we see in municipal governance uh people don't seem to take an interest as much as i do in municipal governance across this country it's not the partisanship that we see provincially or even federally um in the town of stratford would you say people are willing to engage with you on the issues that are important to the town and on the flip side of that question do the people of your community understand the jurisdictions that are uh, that are out there when it comes to federal, provincial, and municipal jurisdictions that this is the responsibility of the town, this is the responsibility of the province, and this is the responsibility of the federal government? Or are people just looking for answers from a politician or a representative like yourself, even if it is a federal or provincial issue? I'll answer your latter, your last question first. Uh, people don't understand the difference of different jurisdictions. Most people don't. Uh, we have about uh, 4,700 uh, dwelling units in our town. I went to pretty well all of them uh, that I could, other than the apartment buildings with restricted access. Uh, so I went to over 4,000 homes uh, when I uh, ran uh, in 2018. And uh, that was a, the one thing that I discovered was that people don't understand the difference between provincial, federal, and municipal jurisdictions. But the chat, what you have to do is really, um, doesn't matter what the jurisdiction is, get it to the right person, get the issue to the right person without telling the person to call another number, to call somebody else. Actually do the call for them and uh, and put that put it on that particular representative's uh, area responsibility to get back to the vet to the person but tell them that you've gotten you know you've relayed their concern to the right person and that uh, if they don't get back to you go directly to that person rather than go through me again sometimes they come back to me anyway and then I have to do it again but uh, for the most part most people are are diligent neither them or their staff will get back to the person and and try to uh, address their concern uh, in terms of whether people are ready to engage or willing to engage um, an awful lot of people will say to me, uh, when you ask them, you know, what do you think of X, Y, or Z issue? Uh, they'll say, well, that's why we hired you. That's why we, you're, you know, you're doing your job. You, you know, we, we trust you to make, uh, to, to look into that and to, and to decide how it should be done because I don't know, I don't know anything about it. I, I just know that it's a problem. And, you know, we had a wastewater issue that, uh, we had lagoons that created a, a smell every year, this time of year. And, uh, we were able to uh, to get the project solved, but when we we had a couple of options, we could have built our own plant. We could pipe it to Charlottetown. Uh, you know, we could have put it to another another location. But uh, at the end of the day, people just said, "Just solve it. I don't care how you solve it and who's involved. Uh, just just deal with it." You know, like does that make your job <laughs> easier? What, in in one way it does. In another <laughs> way, it's it makes it harder because it's it's nice to know that people care about what you're doing but at the same time it's nice to know that they trust you to you know to be able to uh, 
uh, to do what you're responsible for. And your last issue about the apathy, um, I think that is, and again, that is probably the biggest single problem we have in our society today is, is that, that apathy, because that is so dangerous that if young people and uh, like we have a real problem, uh, we have a, a, an engagement, intergovernmental affairs and engagement uh, committee, and I head that committee and uh, there are two groups that are really, really difficult to reach. One are the newcomers, the people who have just come to this country. And in their experience, a lot of times with their government, where they came from, has been negative. And uh, that's the reason they're here is because they're they're trying to get away from that kind of government uh, involvement in their lives and control over their lives. And so they're very distrustful of government, so they don't readily get engaged. Uh, uh, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of different techniques to to uh, give, you know, get them involved. But nine percent of our population are, uh, are newcomers from other countries. And the other group that's really hard to engage are the youth, uh, because I don't know why, but uh, if they're not if they're not engaged, if they grow up uh, totally not engaged, uh, it opens a door for uh, uh, you know certain people, certain kind of person to be able to uh, push certain buttons that'll that'll set them off, that'll take us down a road that's undemocratic and that is where they're not representing people in their best interests, their, their, you know, special interest groups. I think areas in South America are, are you know, examples of that. Uh, I think in the last century, I think there's a couple of examples of those kind of leaders uh, leading to catastrophe, you know? So uh, I think it's something that we really need to stay on top of and really look at whatever the best practices are and what works uh, in other jurisdictions, because we're, uh, we're really doing our best. We've got a youth council and a youth uh, committee, and uh, we really try to uh, engage youth. Uh, but it is a real challenge, and uh, it's a it's a sort of an uphill struggle, to be honest. Now, you seem like a very active person, a very personal person. You're on social media. You're on Twitter. I, I see you on Facebook as well, uh, because I do do a little bit of research before I come into this these interviews. Are there days as a mayor of a small town like Stratford where you just want to be Steve and you don't want to be the mayor and you want to go pick up a carton of milk at the grocery store and not be stopped? Or are you one of these uh, local representatives who sort of strives on people actually getting informed and asking questions of you whenever you are out at a local event or at your grocery store? I'll be honest, it does get a little bit trying once in a while, but most of the time, like I said earlier, I try to look at things through other people's eyes. And if you only have one opportunity to solve your problem and you see somebody that has, a, you think may be able to help you solve it, uh, you're going to take that opportunity. And I, I can see that people want to do that. And uh, and I understand completely. And, uh, and for that reason, I don't really mind. Uh, I'd sooner... I'd sooner somebody called me and I was able to deal with an issue rather than have it blow up on social media and uh, and turn into a, you know, a, a, a real tough situation, give the town a negative, you know, image or whatever. Uh, I'd much sooner deal with the images, speak to people person to person and uh, and try to work together to solve a problem rather than uh, have a confrontation or a, or a fight with somebody. Uh, and most of the time, if you talk to most people, they can be they can be really strident and really upset at the first but after you speak with them and you understand what they're coming, where they're coming from, and why they feel the way they do, and you and you kind of get at uh, and give them some information that they might not have been aware of, uh, things can change pretty fast. And uh, I've been pretty successful in uh, uh, those kind of interactions. And uh, you know, I I pride myself on relationships, and uh, I think that every you know every person, every living person, really is it's a challenge for everybody. Relationships, uh, you know, in all respects, whether it be uh, in, in representing people or whether it be in personal relationships. But uh, I like to think that people think of me as Steve and not as a, as a representative, that it's, it's not a, you know, I like to be able to relate to people personally, understand where they're coming from, not only from a business point of view, but also from a personal point of view. And uh, I think that's really helpful sometimes that, uh, you know, if you know somebody's, you know, somebody, but you also know their family and, you know, sort of uh, about them, then uh, it, it really make, helps things in your in your interactions with that person because you're a little more aware of their situation and maybe why they feel the way they feel. 
I want to turn to the town as a whole because I am cautious of time and I didn't realize that 20 minutes had already passed in this conversation. That's the great thing about these conversations. They fly by, but I get so informed about the people that are representing our communities. So I want to talk about the town of Stratford as a whole here. And before I ask this question, I want to preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion of council. This is his opinion. So, Mayor, Steve as you like to be called, in your opinion, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the town of Stratford today as of recording this episode? Oh, it's uh, it's quite uh, quite obvious. We're, we're a town that's grown so fast that we've sort of like a kid that's outgrown their britches, uh, you know, where we don't have the infrastructure that we need to uh, both social, educational, um, ec- you know, the, the, the retail, uh, there's no there's really no infrastructure to speak of in terms of uh, uh, coming close to meeting the needs of the town. So we're sort of like the new kids on the block in terms of, you know, in terms of our province, because the provincial government, all of a sudden there's this town that never existed uh, 25 years ago. Uh, you know, uh, it's the fourth largest community or third largest community on PEI. And uh, where we didn't exist uh, 25 years ago. So the traditional ways of, allocating resources and uh, you know paving roads and all of those sorts of things uh, they're sort of not relevant to us because we're playing catch up we're we're a town that's uh, you know new and uh, we need we need high schools we need a high school we need and a high school is being built uh, but we need a, a a junior high and one's been promised uh, we had 10 kindergarten classes in our um, in our uh, elementary school this year uh, public school and um, you know, like it's, it's, it's overcrowded. It was overcrowded when they built it. So uh, it's, it's much more overcrowded now. Uh, we don't have a, a rink. We don't have a, uh, uh, we're in the process of doing a study to uh, identify the fundraising and, and to really start the project. We've got the land and everything for the, uh, for the community. We call it the community campus, which will be a central location for all of our uh, uh, recreational uh, uh, infrastructure and, and social be a social gathering place and uh, a welcome center for uh, for newcomers and that sort of thing. But that's the biggest single problem is a lack of infrastructure. We just don't have uh, the infrastructure. It's in the process of being developed and it's on, we're on the cusp of it. But as soon as that happens, I think we'll be a city within a very short period of time. Uh, and it is, I keep making the point with the provincial and federal governments that it's not, a, it's not an expenditure, it's an investment because the more infrastructure you put here, the more people will come here. And the more that'll contribute to the overall economy of the province and of the country. And uh, so, and, it, and it's a great, uh, it's a win-win opportunity, uh, you know, situation that uh, uh, it's just to try to make everyone see it that way. So I, I love playing devil's advocate on this show because I, I like to get to know who uh, I'm speaking to when I ask this question. Infrastructure is a big need for a lot of municipalities across this country right now. And it sounds like you have plans in the works, and the, I say you as in the royal you, as in the the town of Stratford, have plans to develop and grow, but the cost of living is through the roof right now. The cost of doing business is through the roof right now, and while municipalities are struggling to survive because they don't get the funding from the provincial or federal governments that they sort of need to be able to build some of these projects half the time it does come on the backs of the residents the taxpayers via tax property taxes how do you balance that aspect of the growth that you need and the infrastructure projects that the town needs without doing it on the backs of residents well one of the situations we're dealing with right now is it goes right to the core of what you're what you're asking and that is uh a revenue sharing agreement with the uh, with the pre- provincial government is uh, we get about forty percent of uh, the taxation dollar uh, on property taxes, and uh, that's not the case in uh, most most jurisdictions. Uh, if the average is uh, uh, we as a whole in Prince Edward, Prince Edward Island, we get about two cents on the uh, on the dollar, and uh, the which still average, is mind boggling to me that municipalities only get two cents on the dollar. But that's that's, that's for taxation. another. Yeah, that's 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 another conversation in itself that we need to discuss. But continue on. Sorry. 
that, that's all taxation. That's that's uh, income tax, everything. So it's 2% on, on that or two cents on the dollar. And uh, the national average is nine cents uh, on the dollar municipalities get. So Prince Edward Island is way below the national average. But in terms of property taxes, uh, an awful lot of municipalities get 100% of the property tax. Uh, we get 40%. Uh, so we're in the process of negotiating a new deal as a, as a province, uh, the federal um, um, or the um, uh, Federation of PEI Municipalities is uh, is currently in negotiation. And uh, there are promising signs that uh, that will be, um, you know, improved. Uh, I, I don't still don't think we'll get uh, enough to, uh, you know, really have what we need, but we'll we'll get an improvement there anyway. Um, but you're absolutely right that the, the average resident is really feeling the pinch and they've only got so much money and um, uh, their dollar certainly goes a lot less, uh, a lot less distant than it used to, because uh, it does go as far as it used to, because, you know, everything costs so much more. Uh, groceries have gone up exponentially. Uh, you know, the price of rent, uh, you know, the, the cost of, uh, you know, we're, our, we prided ourselves on keeping our tax rate pretty, pretty stable. Uh, uh, since I've been mayor, but uh, uh, at a certain point, uh, you know, you can't uh, you can't get blood from a stone. We can't get more out of people than they can than they can afford. So you have to either cut expenditures or increase revenues. And, uh, the, you know, one of those two things has to happen in order to uh, to do what we need to do. And uh, we're not going to increase expenditures by raising taxes on on people who are already uh, in their view over tax. So uh, I think it's uh, it's a combination of reducing expenditures and, and looking at other sources of revenue. Um, so now, that's, that's, that's a solution. Now you've talked openly since our conversation began about COVID-19, but also the hurricane that just happened uh, earlier this year in 2023. Um, I'm going to ask a very poignant question right now, and I do apologize if it comes out of left field, but how are the town residents doing? Because, after three years of COVID-19 and then to have that on top of this hurricane that just came through and there's other issues that are underlying, are the people of Stratford resilient and in their determination that when they get knocked down, they'll get back up again? Well, I think, uh, I think our towns and residents are really tough and I think they're really resilient. Uh, uh, but I do think there are some lasting effects of, uh, of the hurricane and, uh, you know, I talked to uh, a resident uh, just yesterday uh, who uh, is dealing with, uh, you know, has been diagnosed with PTSD from the uh, from the noise and uh, the stress of, uh, you know, the being without power for three weeks and, and the noise. And uh, during the hurricane, it was <laughs> there was a lot of stuff flying around and uh, a lot of stuff hitting people's houses. And if you live alone and uh, you're subject to, uh, you know, anxiety anyway, uh, it can exacerbate it and even put put people over the edge, you know. So uh, so it has uh, has resulted in some long term effects. Uh, it, uh, it it did did teach us some lessons though that we really need to be resilient. We're we're looking at putting uh, um, you know uh, power sources uh, uh, close to our pumping stations so people uh, you know don't get sewage in their basements, and uh, we we want to have uh, good sources of encouraging people to uh, have. Uh, you know, be self uh, self sufficient in all respects, or as many respects as possible. Um, you know, especially with regard to electricity, and uh, a lot of people are looking at solar panels and uh, uh, generators and uh, battery storage and and those sorts of things to uh, to make sure that they can they can survive without power, without uh, uh, you know, they have enough essentials on hand to last them uh, um, a period of time. The supply chain thing is. You know, we didn't have uh, trucks coming across the bridge for for quite a few days with a, a lot of our supplies that we depend on on a almost daily basis. Uh, and so there were a lot of store shelves were were empty and uh, it was. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's just something that we're not used to, but I think everybody learned from it. So the resilience is there. And uh, we did talk to a, a, a real expert in the area who uh, is going to help us set up emergency response teams of uh, volunteers to uh, Look at things like uh, a lot of our roads were blocked for for days and weeks at a time because trees were down across them. So we we can hopefully get volunteers, of people with chainsaws that are uh, trained and certified in chainsaw uh, operation to uh, that can be activated in an emergency like that to uh, to go clear the roads. And uh, 
and people that can go out and uh, and check on our vulnerable population because that was another issue that uh, we didn't really know who was vulnerable and you know when you're cut off for a period of time and you depend on a CPAP machine or on a, a ventilator or something that uh, you know that can be deadly and uh, so we didn't really know where those people are I mean the healthcare system was able to uh, to deal with it and and you know nobody died uh, but at the same time it's uh, it's the sort of thing we should have uh, we should have at hand, uh, you know those those kind of inventory, those kind that kind of information to enable us to uh, to respond better in the future. I want to turn to my last subject because I am cautious of time here, Steve, and I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that is tourism. I love tourism and I love visiting communities. So I've said to anyone who comes on the show, if you come on the show, I'm coming out to your community. I'm doing great, a swing great. through. I'm doing a swing through the Maritimes in Atlantic Canada later on this year. Okay. So I will be making a stop in Stratford. So to my listeners who are coming, who are listening right now, and to my viewers who are listening right now or watching this, what should people do if they come to Stratford, Prince Edward Island? Well, uh, you should uh, you should come to. Uh, I, I really think our beaches are beautiful. We have a beach called Tea Hill Beach, uh, which is formerly a provincial park, which is now a, 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 a town park, and it is absolutely at low tide. It's absolutely you can walk for miles out on the sand, and uh, you can dig bar clams, and uh, you know it's beautiful. We have a a more accessible beach down at the end, just walking distance from where I am right now, from my place here. Down at the bottom of the hill, uh, Kinlock Beach, which is uh, which is also a lovely beach, uh, you can pursue a, a, a pursuit of mine that is really uh, near and dear to my heart, and that's uh, fishing. Uh, you can go and see uh, some of our um, um, down at the town hall. You can speak to some of our excellent staff who uh, are involved in things like our our voyage towards net zero. Uh, really uh, looking at some of the innovative things that are being done to. Uh, enable people to um, get off uh, oil and uh, and make uh, energy improvements to their homes uh, at zero interest loans uh, and a navigation to, to help you uh, do that sort of thing. Um, you, hopefully by the time you get here, uh, we'll have, we'll be on the road to having our community campus. Uh, we're building the road through it now, putting the infrastructure in like the, everything like that. So you'd be able to take a drive through there. The high school should be under construction uh, this fall or this later this summer, and uh, you'll be able to see that. Uh, um, you'll be able to bat, go bass fishing. Uh, the, the bass are anywhere along the beaches, you catch uh, beautiful striped bass, which they say are the best eating fish in the world. Um, uh, there's so many things to do. We have uh, 500 acres of uh, parks that you'll be able to uh, tour and a lot beautiful trails, lots of like, great hiking trails. Uh, um, anyway, we've got, uh, we've got some beautiful, beautiful areas and, uh, uh, lots of arts and culture here. We've got uh, some sculptures in our, in our parks that are um, uh, sort of world class. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of a lot of really great things here. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to uh, have a day or two of nice weather. Uh, hopefully, it's in July or August, uh, and uh, you'll get good weather. Well, you've perked my interest, but I want to ask this question to follow up on that. Where do you go in the community to decompress after a long day of council meetings, after a stressful day of work, where do you go away and just let it all go? And before you answer, you're probably going to give the same answer that almost every other municipal politician <laughs> says they're home, but I'm going to say you can, but where else do you go? Well, I'm a great, uh, I'm an avid fly fisherman. I love fly fishing and there's nothing more peaceful than that. Anybody that, uh, Fly fishes. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of fly fishing in our in our community. It's not too far away, though. But there is bass fishing where you can go down and sit by and watch a beautiful sunset. Throw your line your line out and sit in a lawn chair and speak with your friends and just talk about sports or whatever whatever subject you want to. World problems or or whatever whatever you want to talk about. So that's I find that's really a, a way to decompress. Um, yeah, um, that's there's a lot. There's a lot of hiking on the trails. Like I said, uh, just go for a nice hike in the woods and on one of our nice trails, and uh, that's a great way to decompress, get some exercise, and improve your health too. I'm I'm not sure when I'm going to be out there. I, I think it's in October, but if fly fishing season is still open, I think oh, uh, yeah. I think there's a I think there's a date between the mayor and myself to go out and do some fly fishing for a few hours just to decompress in the wilderness, but. 
Steve, I want to end my interview with this question, and it's the important question. What makes the town of Stratford such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I think it's a town, it's the residents themselves. Like we have a great culture of respect over here that um, it doesn't matter uh, what you say or, or, you know, it's usually people say things in a respectful way. And even the most, uh, you know, strident opinions are expressed uh, very in a civil way. Uh, our meetings are very civil and friendly. We have lots of disagreements, uh, lots of knock them down, drag them out fights, but it's done in a respectful way, believe it or not. And uh, there's not a lot of uh, personal uh, attacks or anything like that. It's uh, it, it, the, the respect for each other and the respect for our environment. Uh, we're really uh, conscious of our of our footprint on the, on this earth, and uh, uh, we really try to minimize that. Uh, we're uh, we're the only municipality in PEI that's uh, met our our uh, net zero targets, our energy plan uh, milestone four. Uh, we've uh, we've you know got a grant to uh, from from uh, CMHC a million dollars to. Uh, try to help solve the housing crisis by removing barriers to uh, uh, putting low-income housing in. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's uh, it's unique in the sense that we try to be innovative. We try to take advantage of best practices ar around the globe, but also, you know, pr things that are proven. We don't want to be on the, uh, the bleeding edge of technology and, and, and innovation, but we want to, we want to take advantage of opportunities that are out there to improve things for for our town and most of all for our residents, especially around their quality of life. Steve, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and doing this. It's always great when uh, I, I randomly reach out via Twitter and the person who I'm reaching out to responds. So thank you so much. And from the bottom of my heart, I, I say this with sincerity. Uh, thank you for serving. Thank you for giving back to your community and thank you for leading your community through some troubling times, but through some uh, great advancements in your community as well. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you. It's a great, uh, great pleasure speaking with you, Chris. You do a great job. Thanks well, a lot. Thank so with that, I want to remind everyone, put down your cell phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. Until tomorrow, just keep talking.